Um, one thing that I have not discussed is palpation of the supraspinous tendon. Most of us might already know that you can palpate from small intestine 12 and move towards large intestine 16. And if you push down or move the muscle and tendon up front and back, that is the mild tendinous junction where the muscle becomes a tendon. But, which is very powerful, I do all the time. Needle, I even put two, two needles in there, right? But we are neglecting the tendoperiosteal junction where the tendon attached to the bone, which one of the slides of the Jenna Travels picture I showed you where the tendon attaches to the capsule. That is another, an area that I will often assess by direct palpation. And it's a, in, in a confirmed case of supraspinatus tendinopathy, it will hurt when you push on it. And we, 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 with repeated treatment, that is actually a diagnostic tool to confer the progress with more retest, re repalpatory testing that doesn't hurt as much. So I want I know it's not really, we're not really set up to do um, practicals, but I'll do my best to, to give you some pointers on how to successfully palpate the tendoperiosteal junction or the supraspinous muscle. So first, expose your shoulder, your deltoid, and just feel for the AC joint so you can have some landmark where the clavicle meets the, meets the, um, the uh, acromion. And why don't we just put your finger in ally 16? So that's pretty much at the apex or the cusp of the AC joint, okay? So we know that there is the myotendinous junction with the muscle transition to the tendon there. Oftentimes there's issues there. But what I'm talking about is when you follow the general trajectory of that muscle, so you start from palping LI, SI12 and you move towards LI16, you establish a general trajectory and you follow and go now under the AC joint. Now, what can happen is you push, you, you might feel a very big tendon. That is actually the middle deltoid. That's not what we're interested in. You have to move a little bit posterior to that point and you'll find a much finer tendon. We're talking about maybe five millimeter in diameter, okay? That will it be irritating and very, very painful when there's a supersensitive problem with it, there's an inability to AB dock and, and as such. So now the good news is, you know, it might be hard for you to look at yourself because you, you, you don't have a pathology. If a patient have a pathology, it's much easier to find it. But the important thing to keep in mind is that they may also have deltoid problems. So if you just push around anywhere, they'll say, ah, oh, it hurts, it hurts. It, it doesn't help you hone in on exactly the tendon of, of the supraspinatus. The imp most important teaching information I can give you is you find the big one, which is the mid deltoid, and go behind there, posterior, and the smaller one is the supraspinatus one, okay? So now what do you do? You put one needle on either side of that underneath the AC joint. So you're trying to, it's a very local treatment. You're trying to improve local um, perfusion and, and oxygenation and reparation to that area, but that will speed out your treatment a lot faster than just treating the mild tendons junction. And I will oftentimes connect LI16 to that point. So I'm actually crossing the AC joint, but I'm at either end of the tendon. Okay. So um, that's something that um, uh, I have found to be very reproducible. So I, um, I, uh, I didn't get a chance to include that in the slides. I want to make sure you, all, you guys all get that because that made a huge difference, kind of like made me from getting good results to getting good results consistently, okay? So I want to share that with you. So let's show you a picture of um, simulation of a large intestine th uh, 13. Okay. Um, so this is, no, pretty straightforward. Um, it's interesting if you look at the trigger point referral diagram for this muscle on the left here, that you see that it actually refers to large intestine four, okay, area on the back here. And 
knowing that brachia, yeah, so you wouldn't be able to, exp you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it also, the, uh, it goes to the thenar, the hypo, the, the thenar region, right? So already you should be thinking, ah, lower meridian of the lung, right? Because it covers those areas. So you wouldn't be able to explain that referral purely based on the muscular cutaneous nerve innervation of that muscle. The reason why it can do that is because when, the, because of the radio innervation of that muscle, that if there's issues with muscle um, cause traction on the nerve, on the radial nerve, which then can refer problems down all the way down to the uh, distribution of the um, superficial branch of the radial nerve down to um, uh, LI4 area, okay? So um, some general advice on how to locate this point. Um, it is superficial enough, obviously enough that when it's infected, it's swollen and be visible. So uh, you you are, and we'll always rely on the general concept that it's easier to pluck a nerve when it's against the bone. So in this case, the bone is going to be the humerus. And you're going to um, start with where you generally have learned large intestine 14 is, is located, but you're going to err a little bit more posterior. Why? Because the nerve comes from behind, from the posterior side, and you're going to push into the, the bone, and then from there, you release the pressure a little bit and then move into your posterior a little bit to see you feel a bit of clicking. You can oftentimes cause paresthesia into the back of your hand, even from up here. And once you feel the nerve, you just put the needle really close to it. Remember, we're not interested in, in transecting the nerve. We're just going to put, deliver, use needles as a tool to, to deliver electricity. Here's a dissection of what that might look like. Um, you have the deltoid over here. So the elbow is over here, shoulder on the left and elbow on the right. And um, you'll see that there's a, there's a radial nerve trunk. And, and in this dissection, we happen to have also been able to reveal the posterior anterior cutaneous, which ultimately becomes sinjal 10, the re-anchor sinjal 10. The asterisk here is the lateral epicondyle the um, sort of re-anchor location from the classic would put Sanjal 10 approximately here. But in any case, um, when we superimpose the points to this area, we saw earlier large intestine 13 can affect the brachialis muscle as a motor point. So there's your branch of the, um, of the uh, radial nerve actually entering the brachialis muscle. And the difference between large intestine 14 and large intestine 13 is that large intestine, uh, so B here is brachialis, okay, B here is brachialis, uh, A here is, is a brachioradialis. So the difference between large intestine 14 and large intestine 13 is that one is a motor entry point, but one is still on the trunk. So it's, when you stimulate it, you're going to get um, brachialis anyway. But, but LI13 is only a motor point for brachialis. It's not going to affect anything else that's downstream. Okay, so here you have a general location of large intestine 14. And um, let's take a look at what happens to the arm. What would you expect? If it's radial nerve, you're gonna expect extension of the, of the wrist, extension of the finger, extension of the thumb, and perhaps radial flexion of the elbow. Those are the possible movements of radio, of radio nerve stimulation. Okay, so you definitely have radial flexion coming up. Okay, in this particular simulation, it was harder to see any wrist movement because it's striking the person's torso, um, but the video I showed earlier with large intestine 12, when the hand comes up and supinates and if the hand starts to jiggle like jazz hands, um, you can achieve the same thing. Um, it, it would look like that if you were getting the entire nerve. Okay. Finally, we get into um, heart one, and so we can talk about subscapularis.